Welcome, everyone. My name is uh, Phil Lee. I am a professor at UDC David A. Clark School of Law, uh, which is right up the street. Uh, I teach constitutional law, property torts, race in the law, and education law, uh, which is a lot. But I teach what I'm assigned. Right? I'm excited to present this mock class to you. Uh, as a poll, can I see who has read the case? Right? If you were actually in my class, I would just call on you. But I'm not going to do that. I'm going to take volunteers. Right? We're trying to create a safe space. Let me begin with a story. Okay? I was a trial attorney in New York City for five years. Right? And um, one of my first cases I was involved with, uh, there was a discovery dispute. And the other side served a something called a subpoena on my side. Right? A subpoena is a legal mechanism to obtain information for your case. Okay? So I was served this subpoena, and if you're in a government office, I was in a government office at the time, the uh, supervisor just said, figure it out. Right? R read a bunch of cases and figure out what to do. So I go to court for the first time, and uh, the other counsel goes first, and she says, we're here because we're trying to get information from Mr. Lee, and he is uh, moving to quash this subpoena. Right? Quash, it's a legal mechanism to say, no, we're not going to give you this information. Right? And the attorney on the other side said, it's unreasonable. We think it's very unreasonable, and we should get this information. Right? And so this is my first time in court. I'm very, very nervous. I have a, a stack of cases up to here. Where I had to wheel them in with one of those wheelie bags. I've researched for two weeks, and I can't wait to go. Right? And the judge says, Mr. Lee, why don't you tell us you know, what you're here for? And I said, Your Honor, I am here to squash this subpoena. <laughs> There are 10 reasons why this subpoena should be squashed, and I will give you all 10. In the motion part in the New York Supreme Court, which is the trial court in the state of New York, there's usually 100 people behind you talking. What do we do? Right? Should we settle? What's going on? Right? When I was speaking, it was completely silent, because right? everyone heard that I was talking about squash. Right? And I think I went on for one full minute. Squash, 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 squash. Reason number seven, squash. Squash. And the judge finally gives me a hint. He looks down at me from the bench. And he says, Mr. Lee, do you plan to quotes, quotation marks, air quotes, squash this subpoena with all your weight? I don't have no idea what he means. Right? So here's my comeback. Not only with all my weight, but with the weight of legal authority. <laughs> right? right? I, I point to all the cases on my desk, and finally an attorney behind me has some mercy and taps me on the shoulder. And I'm, I'm trying to argue, and I say, yeah, I'm kind of busy here. Can, can you, why don't you talk to me later? And he said, no, you want to hear this. <laughs> and I said, uh, the court's indulgence, Your Honor. Um, yeah, what, what is it? And he says, I don't know where you're from, but in New York State, we quash subpoenas, and we squash bugs. <laughs> I turned bright red. I think I, I uh, whispered, Your Honor, uh, recess, recess. <laughs> The judge says, uh, no, Mr. Lee, continue. <laughs> and, and I'll tell you what, this was early on in my career. I could point to the minute I became an advocate, and it was right there, right there, right? Because I had two options. I could run out of the courtroom and apply to business school, <laughs> option one, or I could stay and present my argument, right? Because when you're an advocate, it's not about your pride. It's not about your feelings, it's about your client's rights, mm -hmm. right? And early on, you want to make these mistakes. I have a mistake folder. Never do that again, right? It grows every year, right? It grows every year. I'll tell you, the law school classroom should be the same type of safe environment where you've read the case, you're not exactly sure what they're saying, right? But I'm going to try. And even if I'm wrong, it's not about me. It's about me developing the skills, right? That's how I define law school classroom space. So even if you've read it and you're not sure what's going on, I hope all of you will try. Right? Because you are being carved into an advocate through this process. Right? Let's begin with the case. Right? The case I assigned is not typically assigned in law school classrooms. I'm a critical race theorist. Right? And I interrogate the ways in which the normal operation of the legal system creates unjust outcomes. 
right? I'll talk about that at the end, a little more detail. But I'm putting my biases, my theoretical presuppositions right on the table and telling you this is where I'm coming from, right? My experience is when I speak to people that have also been marginalized in different ways, it resonates. It resonates, right? So in law school, you might hear professors saying, these are neutral rules and they're fair. Right? And then you look around the world and you say there's lots of people catching hell right? with these rules that are completely legal. How do I explain that? Critical race theory gives you one framework. Right? So let me introduce that to you. Right? In law school, I had to teach myself. Right? Now they have classes right, at some places. Right? But if it interests you, know that that's out there. Let's start with a case. Ozawa versus the United States. I'll take a volunteer. Tell me who Takao Ozawa was. All right, not the dispute, right, not the procedural history, how it weaved its way through the courts, but who was the man to Kalazawa? Yes? Um, he was a Japanese born yes. man who grew up in Hawaii. Yes. And he was born in Hawaii. Yes. Japanese born man who moved to Hawaii, right? I'll take, let's, it's, I call this group recitation, right? I want volunteers to tell me a little piece of the case when I ask you the questions. Japanese man lived in Hawaii, also lived in California, right? What else? Yes? Yeah, and, and give me some examples. He lived the American life, except he wasn't a citizen. Give me some examples. American churches, uh, American high school, University of California for three years. Yep. Excellent. Right, right. So he self-identified and lived as an American. Was there a hand over here? Yeah. He taught his children English. He spoke English in the home as well. Yes. Different point? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, what is the issue? What is Ozawa trying to do? Yeah, was there a hand back here? Let's, uh, let's just stick for hands for now and then we can have a call out. Yes. What? Right. He's trying to become a US citizen, right? Which means if he gets US citizen, he gets state citizenship as well on where uh, he's living. So this is the issue in the case. Can Ozawa? get citizenship. He's foreign born, so what's the process of someone who's foreign born and comes to this country? How do they get citizenship? What is it called? Naturalization. naturalization. I'll give you some history. I'm a historian. Right? 1790 was the first naturalization act passed in this country. Before that, there were no rules governing naturalization or immigration. 1790, first one, the US Congress, who has the power to do these things, right? set forth the rules of naturalization. In the naturalization rule, right, there was something uh, that stated that in order to be naturalized in the United States, you had to be a free white person. There was a whiteness requirement in the Natur Naturalization Act. Right? Let me ask you this. If you had to guess, this is not the case. This is history that I know. What year was the whiteness requirement taken out? So 1790, it was instituted. Right? I'll give you a historical marker. 1865 is the end of the Civil War. Right? People of African descent freed. What year do you think? Yes. 1860. That's a great guess, because you would think, right, end of slavery, then you would take whiteness requirement out. Maybe you would uh, rely less on race. Right? The answer is 1952. 1952, the McCarran-Walter Act. Right? And, and keep this in mind. I never learned this in law school. I had to research on my own. Because right? I look around, and again, I see these unjust outcomes, human suffering. Right? What explains it? It's not neutral rules, not neutral principles, it's not logic. Right? That's a trick. Right? There's something a little bit deeper. Right? And if you have to do that, I encourage you to do so. Right? Why is Ozawa fighting so hard for naturalization? Right? What are the benefits of naturalization? <coughs> Anyone know? Citizenship, what are the benefits of citizenship? Voting, yes, great one. What else? Economic opportunities. Right? Running for certain offices. Anything else? Yeah. Yep. In the 1920s, this country, certain states in this country, passed something called alien land laws. And these laws provided if you're not eligible for citizenship, <laughs> you can't own or lease land. It was race neutral on its face, didn't say Japanese people, but it was targeted right toward them and people of Chinese descent. Right? From 1790 to 1952, whiteness requirement. From 1790 to 1952, people went in court and sued and said, I should become naturalized because there should be an exception or a change to the whiteness requirement. Ozawa is one of these cases. Right? He's fighting for naturalization, to become a citizen. 
to obtain the fruits of American life. Right? I need a volunteer to tell me what the court holds. Right? What does the court think is the big issue here? Right? And what's the ruling? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Which, which, which was? How does the court frame this? Yes. So I'll give you some historical background on that piece. So in the case, if you read the case, it says white people and people of African descent. People of African descent added after the Civil War in 1870. The statute was changed. Right? During the time, Congress had a debate. Shouldn't we just take whiteness out completely? Right? And they said, no, because then Chinese people will come here. J Japanese people will come here. And this is not hidden. Right? This is public record. Any of us right, go to the National Archives, look online, and you can see this. Right? It's not implicit. It's not like the uh, references to slavery in the U.S. Constitution. Right? The, the founding fathers were so uh, mendacious that they didn't say slavery. They said such other persons three times. <laughs> right? It's funny because I have scholars say, oh, isn't that curious or ironic, the, uh, the tension between democratic ideals and the implementation thereof. And I say, and this doesn't make me so popular, ironic? That's mendacity. That's hypocrisy. That's outrage. Right? And they say, calm down. <laughs> just making a point, but if you're not outraged, you're not listening, right? You're not reading these cases, right? The cases they don't teach in the mainstream curriculum, right? So Ozawa was not allowed to naturalize because he was not white. Is there a specific ruling there? Why was he not white? The court says something. They articulate a rule. Yes? Because he wasn't Caucasian. He wasn't Caucasian. That's right. That's right. He was, and they characterize him as something. Not Caucasian, he is of the what race? Begins with an M. Mongolian race. And I think of my, uh, to myself, at the time, that might have made sense, but what is a Mongol, Mongolian? I think of Genghis Khan, right? <laughs> but I think they're referring to people of Asian descent. Maybe East Asian, who knows, right? So that is the holding 1922, Ozawa, okay? Let me juxtapose that with a case you didn't read because I didn't want to give too much to you, right? Three months after Ozawa, oh, and before I do that, let me tell you a little bit a bit about the judge. Anyone remember his name in Ozawa? The Supreme Court Justice who wrote the opinion. Sutherland. Where was he from? Anyone know? England. He was naturalized. Citizen from England. And he is defining the contours of white as a white man. Defining the rights of non-white people. Right? Keep that in mind. Three months later, there's another case before the US Supreme Court. The same judges. Justice Sutherland. Right? Is there. And he just wrote. What, what did he write? In order to be white, you have to be Caucasian. Caucasian means white, correct? Right? Now we have someone who is pretty savvy. His name was Bhagat Sain Tind, T-H-I-N-D. 1923 U.S. Supreme Court case, three months after Ozawa. Look all this up, because people say, that's crazy. I can't believe that really happened. I'm not embellishing. Right? He read Ozawa, and this guy was from northern India, the Punjabi region. And he read Western scientists, the same Western scientists that Sutherland relied on in Ozawa, okay? And he said, you know what? I've read your cultural anthropologists and your scientists, and they say people from the northern region of India, particularly the Punjabi region, are Caucasian. <laughs> gotcha! That's what he was thinking. Gotcha! Right? So I should be allowed naturalization, because according to the people that Sutherland was relying on in Ozawa, I fit the category, right? Uh, the PowerPoint's not working. I have pictures, I have pictures of, these, of these folks, right? And he made the argument in court, let's apply straight logic, okay? Your study, if you're studying for the LSAT, they're gonna give you a logical form called the syllogism. Right, does anyone know what that is? Syllogism, S-Y-L-L-O-G-I-S-M, syllogism. If A, then B. A, therefore B. Okay, this is not, um, and this is what you're learning for the LSAT and the way the people say, this is how you think like a lawyer. I'm gonna pierce that in a second. I'll give you the syllogistic form based on Ozawa, right? If you're Caucasian, you're white. If A, then B. If you're Caucasian, then you're white. A, tinned is Caucasian. What's the conclusion in the sil syllogistic? He should, be white. he should be white, right? Easy, right? You guys should ace the LSAT. <laughs> did, did tinned win before Justice Sutherland? No. Right? Who, well, who, who thinks he won? Who thinks he should have won? Right? See the disconnect? Yeah. Right? I'll tell you what Justice Sutherland said in tinned. I'll paraphrase. I know what I said in Ozawa, 
Caucasian means white. But everyone knows that people from India are not white. They're brown. So let's move away from scientists and talk about a common man understanding. He called it. I would call it a common white man understanding. <laughs> right? And define the contours of race. Right? He lost, and he was excluded from citizenship. He was excluded from the fruits of American life. His family lost land. There are people in his family that committed suicide because they're so devastated. And no one knows about this. Right? These are Supreme Court cases. If you take my con law class, I say, Supreme Court, highest law of the land. Right? There's judicial review based on Marbury versus uh, Madison, then Cooper versus Aaron, judicial supremacy. So everyone has to follow what the court says. This is the highest court putting its imprimatur on defining the contours of whiteness to exclude people. Right? Why do I bring this up? Right? I bring this up to introduce critical race theory, and I'll end at that. Okay? So when I was in law school, we tried to explain these outcomes through logic, syllogism. Right? Uh, and I said, you know, again, I'm looking around at the suffering in the world, and it doesn't look like these rules are fair. Right? These color-coded outcomes, these gender-coded outcomes, these outcomes based on sexual orientation and class. Right? What's going on? How can these uh, principles be neutral and fair right? to everyone? Here's what critical race theory would add to the understanding. First, right, and this is really radical, social justice is the goal of this theory. Okay? Some theories would pretend, oh, we're neutral. We're just going to go in and figure out what's going on and just report it to the world. Critical race theorists and critical legal, legal studies folks would say, no, you're biased in a certain way. Right? And the outcomes you produce will reflect in some way that bias. Right? So there's nothing neutral. So critical race theorists say, first and foremost, social justice is the goal. And then I always get this pushback. Well, what does that mean? It can mean something that, you know, different things to different people. I like Cornell West's definition. Right? He says justice is what love looks like in public. Right? It's not retribution. You just want fairness and equity for everyone. Right? In a color-coded society, in the aftermath of 250 years of slavery, 90 years of Jim Crow, right? centuries of a genocidal push to dispossess Native Americans of their land, of Chinese exclusion from 1882 forward, Japanese-American internment during World War II, the list goes on and on and on. We don't have all day. Right? But if we did, I would talk all day. Right? <laughs> I'm going to wrap this up in one minute. Right? Uh, point number two, theory plus practice equals something called praxis. Right? That, th these are kind of these high sounding words. All that means is you can't really subscribe to this way of uh, seeing in the world if it doesn't change the way you are in the world. Right? So you, oh, you understand that uh, there are systems in place of oppression. What am I going to do on a day to day basis to resist? It's praxis, informed by theory. Right? Final point, and I'll end. It's getting a little warm in here. It's either I'm worked up or it's warm in here. Right? <laughs> little of both. Right? I've mentioned this before, but this is to me uh, the key piece. Right? Critical race theory interrogates the ways in which the normal operation of the legal system creates injustice. The normal operation of the legal system. So it's not so contemporary equal protection. Theory says, where's the bad actor? Where's the one racist person? And we could blame that person. If we can't find that person, there's no liability. Right? <laughs> Critical race theory laughs at that and says, that's an expression of power from power elites. Right? What we're going to do is indict the system. Because the normal operation, it's what's creating the need for Black Lives Matter. Right? The normal operation. It, it's misguided to say, oh, let's find the one person. You'll never find. Maybe you'll get lucky and find the smoking gun memo. I hate everybody, right? But that's a different inquiry, right? Critical race theory asks, what's the normal operation doing to create unjust outcomes, right? Here's the power. So if you accept that premise, that there's systemic injustice built over hundreds of years, right? That's enmeshed with the legatees of that system. We can't separate it from it. We're all in it, and it affects us. It affects the way we think, right? If that's the case, and we accept that, right? That creates a collective of people that want to change the status quo. Right? And so I think the most powerful point for me is critical race theory is for everyone right? that is not satisfied with the status quo. Right? Because we are all part of the structure, all part of the system. The question is, how do we engage in informed praxis to change it together? Right? Thank you.